It's my pleasure to uh, welcome Carolyn Reynolds uh, today for our plenary talk. Carolyn is the lead scientist of the Probabilistic Prediction Research Office in the Marine Meteorology Division at NRL Monterey, California. And Carolyn will be talking about the US Navy's extended range prediction system during. Thanks again, Carolyn. Thank you very much, Anish, Anish and Judith. I just want to say, I think you guys are doing a fantastic job uh, running the show. And also I've learned uh, a lot from all the speakers at the tutorial and the workshop. And I've been really impressed by the, uh, the insightful questions that the students are asking. It's been a real pleasure to be a part of this. Um, so on behalf of uh, a large group of folks at the Naval Research Lab that are working on this uh, global coupled system, um, I'm privileged to talk about the US Navy's extended range prediction system. So I'll talk a little bit about, I'll start talking about motivation and description of why the Navy needs uh, extended range forecasting. Uh, I'll give a little bit of background on high resolution ocean modeling, why we need that, uh, then talk about Navy ESPC performance and research, uh, including uh, trying to identify what we're, uh, what we're not happy with at this point and what we're trying to improve and how we're going to go about that. So many of you have probably seen uh, you know, this image or something very similar to it where it's showing uh, the different um, time ranges of environmental forecasts and then the different sectors and what they need on these different time ranges. And for the Department of Defense, that includes things like uh, for S2S forecasting, includes things like ship routing and prepositioning, uh, planning humanitarian assistance, and managing force deployment. So to uh, try to meet those needs uh, at uh, Naval Research Lab, we're uh, creating an Earth system prediction capability or global coupled system by coupling together our current um, standalone systems, and those include uh, the Los Alamos SICE model for sea ice, the NAVGEM atmospheric model, HICOM ocean model, and then eventually coupling to WaveWatch 3. And it's a big team effort, as I've mentioned before, um, different divisions at NRL, as well as working with the NOAA Earth System Modeling Framework Group. Uh, we're using the Earth System Modeling Framework to couple the systems together, and that's uh, in the hopes of making future upgrades uh, uh, easier, easier to do, easier to sub in new models. Uh, we've been participating in the NOAA SubX uh, experiment, and that's been a really great way to um, for us and for and to look at others interrogating this, the performance of our systems, trying to figure out what's what uh, we could improve upon. And uh, we're very happy that uh, we had version one of the system go operational about a year ago uh, with our operational partners, Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography Center. And they're running 16 member 45 day forecasts once per week right now. And we're also working on improvements to that system and V2 is scheduled for uh, hopefully operational transition in FY23. So this is a, uh, a schematic uh, giving the uh, giving the specifics of the different components of the system for V1 that's operation, operational right now, and then the upgrades that we're planning for V2, and I've highlighted those upgrades in green. And I won't go over this in too much detail. I'll just mention that if you want to read about the specifics of Navy SPC version one, uh, there's an overview article uh, by Neil Barton et al. that references right there. And I'll also mention that I'm going to be talking about the ensemble, uh, the long range ensemble uh, configuration of the system. We also have a deterministic version that has even higher resolution, but that's not yet operational. I won't really be focusing on that at this point. Uh, one thing I do want to mention here, and I've highlighted in red, is that we have really high resolution in the ocean and the sea ice components. Even in the ensemble, we're about nine kilometers at the equator, and it goes to uh, less than four kilometers near the poles. And uh, that I think is something that makes our system, our global coupled operational system, S2S system fairly unique is that high resolution in the ocean and ice. And the reason we do that, of course, is that the Navy uh, needs high resolution in the ocean and ice, not just for the impact that it could have on the atmosphere, but we're actually operating in those realms. But uh, the Navy isn't the only uh, sector that is interested in getting the details of, say, the subsurface ocean correct or, you know, the ice correct. Of course, we have the Arctic ship routes opening up now with um, the, the shrinking of the Arctic ice. 
And we also uh, can see that, uh, for example, if you're interested in marine ecosystems or you're interested in you know, oil spill disaster response, you really need to have a good handle on what's going on in a subsurface ocean. So uh, this is a bit of eye candy that I got uh, from Eric Chassonet at FSU, and it's showing uh, surface currents, an animation of surface currents uh, produced by 1 50th degree high calm uh, ocean model uh, of the Atlantic. It's a two year simulation. And you see all these, uh, this beautiful structure, you see the, um, you know, instability waves uh, in the tropics, you see the meanders of the Gulf Stream, you see uh, these, these, these eddies uh, that are generated uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, those can have big impact on tropical cyclones. Uh, if they happen to go over a warm core eddy, then they can intensify before they hit land. So basically, the, what I want to note here is that we see a lot of energy on uh, fairly small scales in the ocean. But I also want to note that the evolution is fairly slow. In fact, in this animation, a month goes by in about three seconds, right? So things to, to think about in the ocean, you need a lot of high resolution, but also the time to completion constraints are not as severe. And also the, the time, the predictability time horizons can be uh, longer in the ocean than, than in the atmosphere. So why do we see such uh, energetics on the high resolution in the ocean? Well, one reason is because the Rossby radius of deformation is quite a bit smaller in the ocean than it is in the atmosphere. The Rossby radius of deformation being a function not only of, of F, of course that um, uh, increases as you go towards the pole away from the equator, but also uh, a function of, of buoyancy and stability. And so this is a an image taken from Halberg 2013 uh, showing the the resolution that you would need to resolve the Rossby radius of deformation with two delta x. And you can see it goes from fairly coarse at the equator to quite fine um, at, the, at the higher latitudes. It also becomes quite fine when you're operating in these uh, shallow shelf regions off the coasts. Um, so we need high resolution uh, to capture basically the ocean eddies, uh, which can be about this, the weather of the ocean, they can be about a, you know, a factor of 10 smaller than the typical atmospheric weather systems. That's not to say there isn't uh, good reasons to go to high resolution in the atmosphere as well. Of course, uh, one of them being uh, to get away from having to parameterize convection, but but at this point I'm, I'm justifying the, the need for high resolution in the ocean if you want to get the interior ocean correct. Uh, there's another reason that you want high resolution in the ocean. Uh, and this is akin to what Tim Palmer was talking about earlier in the week about uh, the need for high resolution in the atmosphere to get uh, the orography right. You have something similar in the ocean where you need to get the bathymetry right, so the the like the subsurface orography right. Um, and and one reason to get that correct is because when you have you know the astronomical tides moving back and forth over um, subsurface or, or bathymetric features. Uh, they can generate internal tides uh, that, um, you know, that that uh, at, the, at these tidal frequencies. And I'm just showing an example here of cross sections of temperature and salinity uh, from a model simulation uh, taken in this cross section between uh, Luzon and Taiwan. And uh, these are the basically these are are the phenomena that you could see in these beautiful pictures from from NASA looking at you know sun sun glint off of the ocean surface and you can see these internal tides here. So uh, another reason for high resolution is to get the bathymetry right so you can get the internal tides right. And depending on where you are, those internal tides can be very important. This is just showing uh, results from Arbic uh, looking at uh, wave number spectrum from large scale to small scale in two regions. Uh, on top, Kuroshio is, is uh, where the low frequency, basically the non-tidal motions dominate. And then at the bottom, it's near Hawaii, where high frequency or tidal motions dominate. So Arbic here is pointing out that uh, the sea surface height, I should say that this is spectral power and sea surface height, uh, that the variance that you see in sea surface height in some regions uh, can be dominated by tides. And this is important consideration for data simulation because oftentimes we're using, if you're using altimeter information for um, to, to initialize your ocean model, you have to deal with this in some way, either you know filtering them out or explicitly um, assimilating them. Um, so it's 
it's a concern. If there's other reasons uh, that, you know, it, it appears that we need high resolution in the ocean. And an example here is looking at the Gulf Stream, specifically looking at eddy kinetic energy cross sections uh, across the Gulf Stream, comparing observations from moorings uh, along a cross section at 55 West. And I should say this is from a very nice overview paper by Hewitt et al. that came out in 2017. Uh, and the, the modeling results uh, are adapted from Chassonet and Zhu article. And so we're comparing the eddy kinetic energy uh, cross section in the ocean with depth on the left with what we see, uh, the same cross sections from uh, the model, an ocean model run at different resolutions, really high resolution at top 150 degree down to 112 degree at the bottom. And you could see uh, fairly big differences in the amount of eddy kinetic energy that is um, penetrating into the deep ocean and the very high resolution uh, ocean model is the one that does the best job at capturing this deep penetration of eddy kinetic energy from, from the Gulf Stream and into the deep ocean. We also see uh, reflections of using high resolution at the surface when we look at the Gulf Stream. There's a lot of studies that have been done on um, why models may have a difficult time capturing aspects of the Gulf Stream. Uh, specifically, they can have a hard time capturing uh, when the Gulf Stream separates from North America and how far it propagates into the North Atlantic. This is just looking at, at one example here by uh, Marzocchi, uh, where uh, they have um, the errors of models uh, for the Gulf Stream SST from coarse resolution one degree at the top down to one twelfth degree at the bottom. And they find that uh, one twelfth degree ocean is substantially better uh, than the, it still has problems, but it's substantially better than the coarser resolution at capturing the extension of the Gulf Stream into the North Atlantic. And this is important, not just for people who are interested in the ocean, but if you're interested in the atmosphere, a uh, very nice article by Roberts, Vitart, and Balmaceda uh, that recently came out in GRL shows that correcting North Atlantic SST biases in uh, the region of the Gulf Stream uh, can result in improvements to weekly mean atmospheric anomalies, uh, not just over the North Atlantic itself, but also downstream over Europe and Northern Africa. So that's the background material. I hope I've uh, uh, convinced you that there's a utility in high resolution uh, ocean. And right now I'm gonna start talking about uh, Navy ESPC performance and some of the issues that we're seeing and how we're gonna try to get around some of those issues. Uh, I'll be specifically talking about results with a fairly coarse resolution, 37 kilometer atmosphere component, 112 degree ocean and ice uh, forecasts, uh, 60 day forecasts that have been run once per week for the year uh, 2017. I want to mention that the initial states have been derived from parallel update cycles uh, uh, using random observations. So basically this is an ensemble of data assimilations methodology. And uh, we'll also be uh, not just looking at NABGEM, um, uh, comparing to comparing the system performance to our standalone system and, and other systems, but we're also going to be looking at the impact of, say, using a quarter degree ocean and sea ice versus a 12 degree ocean and sea ice, because that's a lot cheaper, kind of see what the impact is uh, from that. And also uh, talk a little bit about how we're considering methods to account for model uncertainty. Also want to mention that the data simulation system is what we call weakly coupled. So the standalone systems are using their own update cycle data simulation uh, methods. So if the atmosphere, that's a 4D VAR, it's actually a hybrid 4D VAR for the ocean and sea ice, it's a 3D VAR, uh, but the background forecast that we're using in those systems is the coupled system. So that's, is from the coupled system. So that's what we're calling a weekly coupled DA system. So just take a look at the performance for the Madden-Julian oscillation as, as we know, uh, as, as we've learned, uh, this is really important for S2S predictability. So this is just showing Navy ESPC performance, uh, the black curve uh, compared to uh, the performance from other systems. Uh, the anomaly correlation, this is for the RMM index is uh, in the top plot and then the RMSE is in the bottom plot. And what we say, see is that for the anomaly correlation, we're doing a good job. We're not uh, quite as good as ECMWF, um, of course, uh, but we're, uh, I'd say in the mix for getting the patterns right. But where we fall short is that uh, the RMSE 
um, you know, we're not quite as good because our model is too strong. We have a positive bias. Uh, unlike most other models, we have an MJ that's too energetic. Uh, we also note, um, I'm not showing that here, but we know that our, our ensemble forecasts for the MJ are under dispersive. So these are two issues that we're trying to deal with, trying to improve as we move from version one to version two. I'll touch on those a little bit later. There are a lot of metrics that we look in the ocean performance. Uh, we look at, you know, how, how it how the ocean is simulating currents, uh, salinity, temperature. Uh, we look at metrics that are important for acoustics. I'm just showing one example here where we're looking at the depth of particular isotherms as a function of forecast time, uh, function of lead time out to 60 days. Uh, so we're looking at the RMSE uh, and the bias and the ensemble standard deviation for uh, the 26, 20, and 15 degree isotherms. This is uh, against uh, observations. And if we compare this solid black line, which is the RMSE of the ensemble mean, to uh, what we would get if we were just using a forecast from a climatology, which is the dashed black line, we could see that we actually don't uh, hit that climatological, uh, uh, hit those climatological values of errors way out until you know later in the forecast. So this is kind of uh, touching on on this this fact that the motions in the ocean are a bit slower. And so we kind of pushing out that time frame for a uh, valid prediction uh, beyond what we see in the atmosphere where things are moving a lot faster. Um, so that's good. Uh, but at the same time, if we compare our ensemble mean RMSD, which is the solid line with the ensemble standard deviation of the ensemble, which is in red, we can see there's quite a lot of daylight between those two curves. Uh, so that is telling us that um, like, like we've noted for the MJO and other forecast uh, metrics, our ensemble forecasts are under dispersion. So, so improving ensemble design is a top priority for us. So before I talk about how we're trying to improve our ensembles, I just wanted to mention a little bit about, uh, throwing two slides here about uh, using a, a lower res resolution ocean and ice uh, component as compared to 12 degree ocean and ice component uh, because yeah, it's a lot cheaper to use quarter degree systems. Um, and so here I'm just showing Breyer scores for 15% uh, ice concentration. That's typically used as ice, as the, as where the ice edge is. And so I'm showing Breyer scores as a function of forecast time for the Arctic on the left and Antarctic on the right. And this maroon curve is uh, what we get from the Navy ESPC. And uh, climatology, it's a bit hard to see. Uh, it's this light, like lilac colored. Uh, curve that goes straight across Gilfold than using climatology. And we're comparing results with the quarter degree uh, forecast at top with the um, 12th degree forecasts on the bottom. And what we see is that we can move this measure, you know, of how long we have scale, how long we can be climatology. We're moving it about five days to the right when we use the high resolution versus the lower resolution. So we are seeing gains, gains in, in things like ice edge prediction uh, from high resolution. Uh, we are also interested in, you know, atmosphere ocean interactions, how that changes with the changing the resolution of the ocean. And so in the study that was led by Sergey Frolov recently uh, came out in monthly weather review, uh, we looked at the correlation, try to, to, trying to understand the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean by looking at correlations between different atmospheric and ocean fields. And here I'm showing correlations between SST anomalies and surface wind speed anomalies, where you see the red colors, that means that uh, there's a positive correlation between SST anomalies and wind speed anomalies. That's uh, typically considered indicative of the atmosphere responding to the ocean. And where you see blue, that means uh, there's a negative correlation. That's typically indicative of the ocean responding to the atmosphere. And so we compare what we see when we have the high resolution on the left with the lower resolution on the right. Uh, we see that the um, that this leads to weaker positive correlations and stronger negative correlations. Uh, so basically, when you go to low, res ocean, low resolution ocean, the ocean becomes less dominant and the atmosphere becomes more dominant in, in this measure of coupling. And so we would expect to see some impact on our atmospheric forecast. So we do, although it's fairly small. And so this is showing uh, uh, results from Justin McClay. He has a, a, 
an extensive ensemble scorecard for the atmosphere, looking at all sorts of uh, metrics and fields and regions. And this is just trying to consolidate that information into uh, one graph here as a function of forecast time. And so where you see positive numbers here, it means that the 1 12th degree ocean is helping the atmospheric ensemble. Where you see negative, it means it's hurting it. So in general, uh, you know, mostly uh, the impacts are small. We do see at long lead times a significant, a nice improvement from 1 12th degree in terms of the bias, which is the green curve, where we see some degradation. That's in terms of variance, uh, the, the, I should say, or the, uh, the relationship, what we expect to see, the relationship between the ensemble mean error and the ensemble spread or ensemble variance. Um, so somehow that's being degraded a bit and we're not exactly sure why that's happening. I wish I could give you an answer on that, but that's something uh, that's that's still being investigated. So uh, some improvements in some fields we're seeing from, from uh, the 12th degree ocean over a quarter degree ocean. So now I just very briefly before uh, before the end of my talk, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how we're trying to address some of the issues that we, uh, some of the, some of the deficiencies that we see in version one. Uh, primarily, we know that our ensembles, both in the ocean and the atmosphere, are under dispersive, and uh, so one way to we're trying to correct that is through adapting something called analysis correction based additive inflation. It's a technique that's outlined by uh, Will Crawford in an overview paper, and it's it's based on earlier on um, ideas earlier introduced by Bowler et al. and Piccolo et al. And basically, we're using an archive of analysis corrections. So um, using information from our data simulation update cycle to, uh, to calculate both uh, a mean uh, correction that, that you know, that's supposed to correct the biases in the forecast as it moves forward. Uh, so it's a time mean term. And then we also have a stochastic component uh, to address this ensemble uncertainty, this ensemble spread deficiency. So there's more details in Crawford et al. on this technique, just to briefly show you some results that we're getting. Yep. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Two okay. minutes. Got it. OK. Um, so uh, the uh, I just wanted to show that uh, the Navy SPC, uh, with a psi, we see uh, if we look in terms of a global metric, the impact of the bias on total precipitable water, for example, we see a really nice reduction uh, in terms of a global average. So just showing on the top as a function of forecast time, the control forecasts uh, is in blue, uh, a psi is in orange. Uh, the global average of the absolute value of the bias is on the left, and the mean absolute error of the ensemble mean is on the right. And so on a global average, we see, uh, you know, things look great, a, a really nice uh, reduction in, in these error metrics. When we look at a plan view plot, that's on the bottom. What we're showing here, this is for day 14, we see the blue area is showing where we get improvements from SI, and the orange is showing where we see degradations. And so we see that um, we have um, a lot of areas where we see blue, but some areas where we see degradations. And um, this tends to be where the bias changes in lead time and or we are assuming that there are state dependent biases. So we're trying, we're currently working on ways to try to refine this technique um, so that we can get rid of some of the troubling issues while, while keeping uh, the, the benefits. And I'm going to skip over this. We also looked at the impact on, on the MJO. I'm going to skip over this uh, uh, because of uh, just trying to get things done on time. Um, and I'll just briefly mention that we're also looking at uh, stochastic forcing in the ocean. And we can control that stochastic forcing as a function of depth in the ocean. And we're uh, working on, on calibrating that and then looking at the impacts of that. Very briefly, I'll mention other upgrades that uh, we're planning for V2 includes um, uh, that we're going to be incorporating ocean ties into our ensemble configuration. We're going to be having a one-way coupling to WaveWatch 3. Eventually, we'll move to two-way coupling, but the first implementation would just be one-way coupling. And then an extension to the middle atmosphere that we've, uh, we've heard from uh, speakers yesterday talking about how doing a better job with the stratosphere should improve the uh, troposphere. So we're going to be uh, moving towards that as well. And then just to wrap up, uh, we have the operational forecast uh, went forward in 2020. Um, 
Uh, we're expecting a lot of improvements, uh, hopefully, with uh, version two that's scheduled for 2023. Uh, and then looking further out uh, to, to FY26 or FY27, uh, replacing Navgem, which is an old model, with uh, Neptune, which is a is a, is a next generation model that has things like uh, cap capabilities like static and adaptive mesh refinements. And that will allow us for kilometer scale atmosphere ocean coupled forecasts. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you for your time and just put up my last slide. Thanks. Thank you, Kellen. Yeah, that was a really comprehensive and great overview of the Navy prediction system. Thank you again. So Judith, you have a question on the chat. Hi, uh, Carolyn. Um, uh, really nice talk. And uh, one thing Carolyn and I share is we we always are interested in model errors and how to correct for them. And I think SI is a really nice method to do this. Um, uh, in terms of um, improving forecast skill, my question is: Have you found that helpful in um, learning about model shortcomings from a physical standpoint for either missing processes or wrongly represented processes? And have you been able to improve the model uh, based on those SI tendencies? Or do you right. have any ideas how to do it? Right. Um, so yes and no. So <laughs> uh, so we have, haven't yet improved the model based on these, uh, but we are trying to use uh, the information uh, that we get uh, from SI to, to learn about. It's, it, it's to learn about uh, model deficiencies. In particular, we're using um, process-based diagnostics uh, uh, and looking at how SI might be changing some of the process-based diagnostics, uh, in particular, looking at you know, MJO um, and what may be you know, leading to mean state, what, what terms may be leading to mean state biases in, um, in, in the moisture and moisture gradients and how uh, that changes with SI. Um, so we're trying to move in the direction of learning, you know, it's one thing, as, as you know, it's one thing to identify model biases is quite another to try to figure out um, what's causing them, what's the root cause. And so we're moving in that direction. Um, but, um, you know, as a good example of, you know, aha, aha, we found this and we fixed it, we don't have that yet. Um, but hopefully we'll get there. Great. Thanks, Judith. And thanks, Caroline, for the response. Hi, Lynn. You have a question next. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the nice talk, Karen. And um, yeah, your, your system uh, with a very high uh, ocean resolution is, is very imp impressive. So my, my question is, uh, I, I'm not sure the MGO scale you show, is that based on a real forecast or uh, that's on uh, the, the real-time real forecast? And also, uh, yeah, and, and also uh, is, uh, you didn't uh, mention much uh, about your reforecast. So is the data assimilation and also the uh, ensemble members are the same as the real-time forecast in, in, the, in the real forecast? Right, uh, so, uh, so um, this, is, these, this is actually based on a year of, of, of the operational system uh, forecasts. Uh, so it's okay. just a year. And All it's, right. so uh, is the bias corrected? Or? This is not bias corrected. And okay. this is one issue that we're working on right now uh, in that we're trying to put in place, because we have the 20 year sub X system that is slightly different from the operational system. Um, so the results you hear you're seeing are slightly different from, from sub X in, in a couple of ways. The model has changed a little bit, but I think the big difference is that this is a 16 member ensemble uh, as opposed to what we have in sub X is a, is a four member uh, lag, you know, four member lagged ensemble. So starting the forecast, you know, Thursday through Sunday, you know, one forecast a day. Um, so the issue of post-processing is a really big one that we're trying to tackle. And we're, we're hoping to get something started that would, would be producing, um, you know, a reforecast on the fly, similar to what ECMWF uh, does at this point, but we don't have that at this point. Okay, thank hoping you. to continue okay. with that. Great, thanks, Highland. Thanks, Caroline. Andy Robertson has the next question in the chat. Hi, Caroline. Great talk. I was intrigued by your nice slide on impact of ocean resolution on the atmosphere, and uh, you showed that it, in that slide, it 
it's more blue over the Indian Ocean uh, at, at lower lower resolution than than at than at higher than a higher resolution. So does does that mean that uh, the ocean's responding to the atmosphere less when you have a higher resolution? Any comments on why that might be? Yeah, I think it's the the other way. It's, it's this always I always find this tricky. <laughs> um, but for, from what I from what I understand, and you know, just just thinking about the, you know, when we see blue, uh, the negative correlation, thinking uh, that's indicative of the ocean responding uh, to the atmosphere, uh, because yeah. you think, well, you know, you have high winds, and that br brings up cold water. You know, high winds brings up. Uh, subsurface water deepens the mixed layer, et cetera. So you would get a negative correlation um, ocean responding to the atmosphere. And we see that that, that that ocean responding to the atmosphere actually gets stronger. Uh, so the blue is gets stronger when we go to, to a lower resolution on the right. Um, and we also see that the, the reds tend to get weaker. So right. I think in general- so, so I was thinking that at higher yeah. resolution, then there's less blue. So yeah. I was wondering why 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 is that over the Indian Ocean in, in particular that that is is happening? Yeah, it's so I don't have I don't I, I don't have a good answer for you other than we seem to be kind of moving the balance away from atmosphere dominating to um, uh, we seem to be moving the balance towards more uh, dominant atmosphere. Um, so that might be important for sort of monsoonal studies there, where normally we think the ocean is responding to the atmosphere, but it seems if you go to high res resolution that it's less the case. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, that's right, that's right. And the, the physical mechanisms for, for how this is occurring, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, we, we don't know, but that, that does seem, you know, the general finding is that kind of this, you know, you go to lower resolution o ocean that the, the atmosphere becomes more dominant and that kind of the impact of the ocean becomes more important when you go to finer resolution in the ocean. But the physical mechanisms, I, I don't I don't really have a great feel for what's happening there. Thanks. Good question. Thanks, Andrew. And thanks again, Caroline, for a great talk and the discussion as well. Um, so okay.